Okay, thank you for being back. So now we'll switch again to another organism, Planaria, and, and we are pleased to have Jochen Ring from Göttingen, uh, the Max Planck Institute, to talk about growth and form in Planarians. Thank you, Jochen. Thank you very much, Thomas, <coughs> for the introduction and also the kind invitation to Paris. Sorry, I'm just losing my screen here for some bizarre reason. All right, now it's back. All right, so um, I hope you're all sufficiently caffeinated for this talk. Um, disclaimer up front, I will not be talking about form at all. I will just be uh, focusing on, on growth um, today. And um, first of all, growth uh, is, of course, something that hmm, should not be taken for granted. No. <laughs> all right. So growth is, um, I think, pretty much a universal feature of biological systems. And so, for example, here just illustrated um, by um, the example of, of fish that, um, you know, originate from this um, single fertilized egg, then hatch, but then um, don't stop growing, importantly, but they keep on growing throughout their life and can actually reach tremendous sizes and therefore also tremendous size differences as adults. And this means, of course, that um, whatever development has established um, at post-embryonic stages of the life cycle still has to be able to grow and to scale massively. Second example of scaling is, in this case, of course, um, the animal keeps its overall proportions. But when we now think about the, or, uh, the, the differences in shapes between different species, um, then, of course, the very famous Thomas Darcy Thompson um, um, geometric transformations come to mind, where he basically pointed out that we can also conceptualize uh, the differences in shapes between different species as geometric transformations, that is, unequal scaling of the body axis um, between different species. So in this case, also, in a way, a phenomenon of growth, but no longer isotropic, or more or less isotropic as in this case, but anisotropic in which different axes grow. And then another um, really interesting aspect of scaling, of course, or scaling is also a really inter um, integral aspect of regeneration. And um, as many of you know, um, so for example, many amphibians or many salamanders are very good at regenerating their limbs. So they can basically regrow a fully functional limb um, in the context of their adult body plan. But also, intriguingly, if you cut the limb of a large newt, um, it regenerates a large limb. If you cut the limb of a small newt, it regenerates a small limb. So somehow, the scale of the limb to be regenerated is part of the system's property, such that this animal, um, or the cells of this animal, collectively always know at which scale to regenerate the limb. Now, I guess, all of you um, agree that there's lots of interesting biology in here. And just to illustrate this point very briefly, so for example, when we think about scaling of body plants, then we also need to necessarily think about the scaling of the underlying patterns. And here um, already things become interesting because, for example, with this uh, textbook model of a morphogen gradient where the morphogen is secreted at one end of the cell field, and then via coupled diffusion degradation establishes this morphogen gradient in the cell field. Right? So in this case, if you want to scale such a gradient, then ultimately you need to somehow change the diffusion or the degradation, grade, um, the degradation constants of this in order to make it scale. And question, how do you do this? Or for example, um, also related to diffusion degradation, um, given that diffusion due to this inverse square law relationship to distance has, um, uh, is basically really useful only for smallish embryo-sized structures. So I think also one really interesting question in there is how large post-embryonic structures, so for example, at the scale of an adult salmon, how they are patterning and maintaining their body plan proportions. Second, um, simping, uh, th thinking about the issue of growth, as we heard in the previous talk, so um, scaling up the size of a complex tissue um, is, of course, also inherently a very, very complicated problem. So when you think about having to coordinate proliferation and growth across different organ systems, um, this already sets up many interesting questions. 
And for example, also such questions as what are the limits of growth, so what specifies when a structure actually should stop growing, um, and how to maintain proportion between different organs are all fascinating and I would say poorly understood questions. And then finally, um, size is also, um, I think, a very important constraint on biological systems. And so linking to Jonathan's talk this morning, um, so for example, one um, feature um, in which the um, size probably is a very, very deep down constraint in biological systems is this phenomenon of metabolic scaling, whereby when you measure the metabolic rate or when, when you measure the mass of animals um, and you plot it against the metabolic rate of these animals, then what you find are actually um, amazingly uh, uh, straight line relationships all across animal phylogeny, um, whereby the slope of this um, power is basically a power law um, with an exponent of three quarter. And so again, somehow deep down, the metabolic rate of animals seems to be constrained by mass, but why and how um, remains rather unclear. So long story short, I think lots of interesting biology um, pertaining to um, the scaling of organ systems or to the governance of growth in biology. So now our model system or the model system we use in, in the lab are actually planarian flatworms. And up front, planarians are fairly normal animals. So um, they, are, um, they are actually phylogenetically they are in here, um, in the Lophotrochozoans, so they are more closely related to leeches or, um, or mollusks, um, but they are actually far away from, from C. elegans, or from the roundworm. Um, and that means simply that worm-like body plants have arisen multiple times in evolution. Secondly, also planarians are very, very diverse as a taxonomic group itself. So um, we actually spend a lot of our time collecting and um, establishing culture conditions for diverse planarian collections in the lab, but I will not talk about this angle today. And in general, planarians are actually fairly normal animals. So they have a brain, they have a central nervous system, they have these photoreceptors in the head, the eyes that makes them also unusually charismatic for worms because um, they can look back at you. Um, and they have um, various other organ systems. So what we will talk about a lot today is the gastrovasculature. So this is actually the intestine of the animals, which has two purposes. First, to digest the food, as in all other animals, but secondly, also to distribute the food, because what planarians don't have is a circulatory system. So no blood flow, no heart. However, what makes them a little bit unusual already is that they have... Um, Pluripotent, oops, uh, they, have, um, f uh, they are full of these um, stem cells here. And actually, these stem cells are found everywhere in the animal between the organ systems. And they are not just any kind of stem cells, but they are pluripotent stem cells. So you can take a single one of these stem cells and transplant them into an irradiated animal. And um, the descendants of this one stem cell will actually recolonize the entire animal and cause a complete conversion of the genotype from the host to the donor. So clearly an operational demonstration of pluripotency. Now, these stem cells are really piv pivotal, piv pivotal sorry, <laughs> to um, uh, planarian biology or to practically all aspects about planarian biology because they are the only cells in the system that can divide, right? So even um, skin cells or gut cells cannot divide. So whenever a new cell is needed anywhere in an animal, somewhere a stem cell has to divide. Now, the descendants of these stem cells um, somehow, presumably by cues provided ultimately by differentiated cells, um, orchestrate the fate choices and the lineage choices into the right cell types. And at the same time, cells continuously die. And so, um, in effect, the entire animal is actually continuously renewing itself we think there are no long-lived cell types in planarians, meaning um, maybe with the exception of the stem cells, um, everything is probably getting replaced um, within two months or so. And um, clearly, lots of interesting biology in here. 
So just for example, how to orchestrate the, um, the total of lineage choices available in this animal constitutively at steady state, given that the source of all cells are these pluripotent stem cells, is already interesting. And secondly, also the removal of cells here um, is again very interesting because the animal actually recovers the somatic cells and uses them for energy. So for example, we could just recently show that the skin cells on the epidermis actually dive back inside and then um, um, get digested in the gut of the animal and they accumulate under chloroquine treatment. So basically, long story short, this is a highly dynamic system that continuously self-renews. Now, this bestows planarians with a number of interesting properties. And the first of one is that they're incredibly good at regenerating. So in this case, for example, um, this animal is cut into 18 pieces. So once down the midline, eight times across. And within um, just about two weeks, each one of these pieces actually reshapes itself into a complete and perfectly proportioned little planarian. Now, this means, of course, but due to conservation of mass, if you take a large piece, you get a large regenerate. If you take a small piece, you get a small regenerate. But nevertheless, um, the animals always regenerate all aspects of planarian um, physiology and anatomy. So meaning that their anatomy per se must be intrinsically scalable. Moreover, um, on top of that, when you even outside the context of injury, when you feed the worms, they grow. Um, so this in itself is not overly unusual, um, but the range um, over, over which this growth occurs is actually quite dramatic. So the model species at its smallest size is about half a millimeter long, and at its largest size, more than two and a half centimeters long. However, the interesting thing in planarians is when you take the food away, they literally reverse the growth process and they shrink back to their, um, to back in size meaning that the momentary size of the animal is actually a function of, its pa of the past energy availability due to feeding. Now, importantly, growth and degrowth are due to changes in cell numbers, um, meaning that a small animal consists of about 5,000 cells, and a very large animal consists out of about 8 million cells. So meaning that also planarian anatomy, um, give the individual organs, have to scale accordingly over this enormous range in cell numbers. And so, long story short, um, what planarians, or what, what this actually gives us as a model system, is a model system in which we have body size as an experimental variable, um, because also I should say the strain we mostly work with in the lab, they are asexual animals, and they don't actually show any signs of aging. So we can essentially reversibly scale the adult body plan of the species backwards and forwards, depending on experimental conditions. And so, of course, one interesting question in this context was, given that we have such a system that can scale um, so uh, tremendously, do we still see metabolic scaling? And um, to my mind, um, and the answer to this is surprisingly, Yes. Um, so when we measure now also using microcalorimetry on starved animals or animals that haven't been fed for two weeks, what we find is um, that the metabolic rate versus mass scales almost perfectly with the three-quarter exponent. So in this case, we are not comparing apples and oranges or frogs and chickens, but we are really looking at metabolic scaling inside a single species. And so the question there was, well, basically what this shows is that despite um, this very unusual physiology of planarians, they still um, uh, ultimately are subject to Kleiber's law, which again I think illustrates um, that there must be something really fundamental about um, this trade-off between metabolic rate and mass. And so having shown this in planarians now, um, the question was, where does it come from? Because first of all, I already introduced this very briefly, that um, ultimately we are dealing with a power law here, where by the larger the animal gets, um, the, um, the smaller the metabolic rate versus the mass of the animal ultimately becomes due to this sub one power exponent, due to this three quarter power exponent. So now we could either get this relationship um, by a change 
in the, um, by a decrease in the metabolic rate per cell. And this is what's commonly assumed in the literature. However, if we now measure the metabolic rate of the animal and we normalize it versus cell numbers, then we essentially get a flat line. So this means that, again, under the caveat that so far we only looked at starving animals, this means that the metabolic rate per cell is actually size independent. However, we can also get this power law relationship if in fact the mass per cell were changing. And um, not surprisingly, this is actually the case. So basically the larger the animals get, um, the heavier or basically the higher the, um, the coarse grained mass per cell. And not surprisingly, the mass per cell increase precisely gives us this three-quarter exponent, or relatively precisely gives us this three-quarter exponent. Moreover, we also know where this mass per cell increase comes from, and actually this predominantly comes from, the, um, from metabolic energy stores. So basically, the larger the animals get, the more uh, triglycerides and other storage compounds they accumulate in their intestines, leading to a dramatic growth um, of the intestinal cells because they are really literally filling up with lipid droplets. So at a simple level, this means size-dependent energy storage causes the three-quarter exponent in planarians. Um, but of course, the question now is, why three quarters? So why, even in these very, um, very weird animals, why is it that the size-dependent lipid storage, for example, is set to exactly such a point that we again get out the three-quarter exponent? Um, disclaimer, at the end of the talk, you still won't have an answer to this question. However, <sighs> Outlook, never install it. Um, at the end, um, there are now, um, Actually, a, a great number of, or well, or a, a large number of theories out there that explain where the three-quarter exponent could come from. And so, for example, one of the prominent theories in the field of metabolic scaling is a so-called WEB theory that um, ultimately posits that um, the, the, um, the three-quarter scale exponent arises out of the um, supply limitations of um, um, uh, circulatory networks. In making the assumptions here that um, basically the supply networks follow um, are essentially fractal with um, size invariant terminal branches and minimized hydrodynamic resistance, um, these people showed that they could derive a three-quarter exponent. Um, in addition, there are other theories out there that, for example, try to derive the three-quarter exponent from um, the scaling of reserve components, so for example, lipid droplets versus active, metabolically active cytosol. And again, you can get out a three-quarter exponent, but again, under quite um, a significant number of, of um, assumptions. And so, long story short, um, all of these theories uh, are, of course, at the moment just that. So they are theories that have essentially never been tested. However, so with our um, on base, <sighs> long story short, um, they are fundamentally not tested theories, but however, um, uh, they are still of great value because they can at least give us constraints um, and also ideas of directions to explore. And just very, very briefly, so I think it makes intuitive sense that for reactions um, that, as Jonathan also has shown this morning, uh, ultimately come down to the supply of, of energy um, versus um, the other reactant, which is oxygen, it makes sense to think about transport networks and about um, tra exchange surfaces that could potentially become limiting as the animals get larger. And so in this case, um, this, is our, well, this was one motivation for starting to look now at scale relationships um, within the transport network of planarians. So this is, uh, again, the gut, the um, gastrovasculature that you can see basically expands tremendously also along with the growth of the animals. Now, just briefly, this is, not, um, this is a network that's, um, that's not uh, having uniform flow because the only entry and exit from the network is actually here. So basically when the animals feed, they fill up all the branches with food. It stays in the gut for about three to four days, and then it is again excreted via exactly the same body opening here. 
So this just as a little disclaimer. Second, what we have now done is um, we have basically skeletonized these networks. We can define levels of branch hierarchy, and so we can actually quantify network structure in these animals. And just, um, just a glimpse, so this is very much work in progress. So what we are starting to see now are indeed um, size-dependent scaling allometries that are coming out. So for example, if we, bring, if we plot what we call branch density, so basically the total length of branches versus the total branched area, then what we find is actually that again we get um, stop sub stoichiometric scaling, meaning, uh, and again, interestingly, this um, scale um, uh, exponent of 0 0.525. So, meaning as the animals get larger, um, the distance or the branch density actually um, seems to be decreasing. So, at the moment, this is just numerology. Um, however, what we, are, uh, what we are trying to do is to um, accurately quantify, as I already said, this, um, the surface areas of the gut, but also the extra, um, the, the animal surface over which it takes up oxygen in order to at least have the constraints um, in which these metabolic scale relationships develop. And second, what we are also doing is um, now um, systematically screening for defects in this branching morphogenesis process. Um, in order to then be also able to correlate changes in the branch structure with changes in metabolic scaling, for example. However, apart from um, this metabolic scaling per, um, per se, there are also many other aspects of planarian physiology that are actually strongly size dependent. So, for example, um, also the growth rate of the animals is strongly size dependent in the sense that small animals grow very rapidly whereas large animals grow rather slowly, but small animals also degrow very rapidly, versus while large animals degrow more slowly. Or another really fascinating aspect is that actually in um, sexual strains um, of planarians and of the model species, an entire hermaphroditic reproductive system develops post-embryonically once the animals grow beyond six millimeters in size. And once they grow beyond six millimeters in size, they start to form testes, ovaries, um, yolk glands all over their body, whereas before there's not, not a trace of these different organ systems. So all of this then together um, raises the question to what extent planarians are actually aware of their body size or whether there are mechanisms in place that sense body size and then convert it into different um, physiological outcomes be it growth rate, reproductive system development, or potentially even gut branching changes. And we approach this question um, simply by um, deep sequencing individual animals um, spanning the entire size range um, that we have available in the model species. And um, we, uh, yes, and so basically then um, we simply ask, do we find systematic gene expression changes that are correlating with size? And so interestingly, there are about three to 400 genes in these animals that are indeed strongly correlated with size and that actually display quite a rich set of dynamics. So for example, things that are high in small animals, very low in large animals, or vice versa, or that also peak at intermediate sizes. Now, um, importantly, what we see is both um, a combination of genes that, um, in which very likely the promoter activity is size dependent, but we also see cases where the cell type that expresses the gene is actually size dependent itself. So for example, for these cells, we see hardly any of these cells in small animals, but in large animals, they are full of this cell type. So basically, suffice it to say that size dependencies in um, mRNA content can reflect both changes in promoter activity or changes in cell type abundance. And in addition, um, we, also, um, uh, we also know that uh, these size-dependent genes, they cover many aspects, many functional categories. So um, also prominently represented amongst them are actually lipid storage enzymes, which we might have predicted to begin with. Now, um, an important question here is how precise, of course, is this correlation between gene expression level and size of the animal? And so here, essentially, we repeated the same experiment to then ask um, whether in, um, in a replicate in, or, and to look at the variance of measurement points at a given size, basically as a measure of the reproducibility of the correlation between gene expression level and size. If we do this, we find um, that actually in, um, for the best genes, 
we get um, we can tell the size of the animal that was sequenced with an accuracy of about plus minus six percent just on basis of the expression level of a single gene. Um, a second measure that we have explored um, to quantify the correlation between size and gene expression level is actually mutual information. And we find again that the most highly size dependent genes have an inf a mutual information of two, so meaning um, four bit, which means they can um, differentiate, um, I believe, uh, uh, sorry, no, I lost that. Um, they can, um, we can differentiate at least two different um, size categories. But of course, by combining now multiple genes that show different size dependencies as shown for the Drosophila stripe pattern formation network, um, uh, you can easily imagine that the animals actually are able to um, tell their size um, on quite a precise manner on basis of the expression of the size dependent genes. Um, fine, so there is this um, reproducible correlation, but to what extent is this now correlation versus size dependence? And here, interestingly, so what we made use of is this um, little trick that we can play in these animals. And this is that we can um, either feed the animals up to a given target size, or we can, sorry, this is this arrow, or we can starve, we can take large animals and starve them down to a target size. And we can then ask to what extent are the gene expression um, dynamics still representative of size changes versus feeding history. And without going into much detail, so we find again that actually a, a large fraction of the, uh, of the gene expression level information can be attributed to system size. Um, so much so that the principal component one um, that, exp um, that um, basically um, represents size information, um, the curves of uh, these different treatment paradigms collapse onto exactly the same curve. So meaning that indeed system size is a key determinant of gene expression. So second, we can um, use the second feature and that is we can now make to use creative salami slicing and cut off different parts of the animals um, systematically and then ask to what extent and when um, do the gene expression levels um, again mirror the acutely changed system size in this context. And um, uh, again, this experiment works very nicely. So we can see that the tiny fragments here um, at the end are also giving rise to tiny tissue pieces and long story short, the fragments do sort out according to size. Interestingly, not instantaneously, but with a time delay of about five to seven days. So meaning it takes about five to seven days before everything is in place again for um, the system, for the gene expression levels to report on system size. And interestingly, again, using this principal component analysis abstraction, we see that again, even during regeneration, the size changes, the effect of size changes on gene expression, again, collapse on the same curve. So meaning, again, that we basically very likely have a size sensing mechanism in these animals that influences gene expression in a size dependent manner. So now the question, of course, is, what are the underlying mechanisms um, that coordinate that? And to get at this, we raised an antibody against one of the most size-dependent transcripts. This is the C-type lectin. Interestingly, this is an immune system component that is much more highly expressed in large animals than in small animals. And this gives us a very high dynamic range of about um, three orders of magnitude um, that we can measure. And then we can combi combine this with an RNAi screen where we simply knock down now um, um, signaling pathway components and also the most size dependent genes to ask whether we can uncouple um, the levels of this um, reporter protein from the size of the animal. And long story short, um, the answer to this was yes. So we did actually find um, um, quite a number of components of the active in signaling pathway um, that when we knocked them down, um, they um, basically dramatically reduced the levels of this protein, meaning the protein was now expressed at a level um, equivalent to much smaller animals than what we actually screened. Importantly, um, the, oh yeah, sorry, active in signaling pathway, uh, many of you will know it as um, uh, simply a family branch of the highly conserved um, TGF beta family of signals. Now, um, importantly, we, when we now systematically check all components of the activine signaling pathway, 
we find that all of them um, invariably um, downregulate the signal, whereas other TGF beta family members do not. So this seems to be really a specific effect of activin. Um, and in addition, um, it is not just this one protein, but many, not all, but many of the size-dependent genes are actually changed in their expression level when we change activin signaling. So this means that activin for sure is, um, or likely, is a component of this underlying size sensing mechanism in these animals. And now, um, meaning that somehow the system size via activin um, has to be converted into gene expression. But now the question is how does activin act? So it could, on the one hand side, it could be permissive, meaning that um, the pathway activity may be independent of size and you just need a little bit of activin signaling for something else to um, exert the size sensing and size dependent gene expression, um, which would mean that also pathway activity would not necessarily have to correlate with gene expression or with size. Or second, activin signaling could also be instructive, meaning that pathway activity should depend on system size and pathway activity should also correlate with gene expression levels. Now, to get at this, um, we first had to raise antibodies, um, and we borrowed here the established strategy from Drosophila, um, raising antibodies against the phosphorylated state of the signal transductor, uh, transducer, the SMAT2 here. And uh, second, we made an antibody against the total SMAT, meaning that we could take the ratio between phosphorylated and non-phosphorylated SMAT as a readout of pathway activity. And again, using RNAi to verify this tool, we can be sure that this is indeed a report or assay for measuring pathway activity. Now, um, interestingly, when we look at um, this, uh, the ratio between phosphorylated and total um, versus body size, we see that indeed activine signaling is strongly size dependent. And again, these are just very primitive whole um, in C2 lysates of whole animals. So basically, this means that systemically, active in signaling levels are much higher in large animals than in small animals. And actually, the shape of this curve or the shape of the size dependency also in many ways mirrors the size dependency of the active in ligand expression, which incidentally is one of the most size dependent genes itself. Um, and then secondly, also when we now use, again, our amputation paradigm, um, it is interesting to see that activine signaling changes very rapidly during regeneration, and actually the activine signal itself is one of the um, most rapid predictors of final tissue size, so more rapid than many of the genes in the data set. So clearly this means that systemic activine pathway activity is indeed size dependent. So what about target gene expression? So is target gene expression now dose dependent on activin levels? And um, here, again, using RNAi titrations to systematically vary activin signaling levels, we can actually show that many of these size-dependent genes are, in fact, also dose dependent um, to activin signaling. Um, and meaning that there's a proportionality of gene expression level and activin signaling strength. Second, if we now look at animals of different size and we change activin signaling levels systematically, either by knocking down activin or a negative inhibitor, so to increase activin signaling, we can, for the same genes, we can actually show that we can uncouple, um, to some extent at least, the expression of the gene from uh, expression levels from size, and so they directly follow the activin size dependence. So putting all of this together, this means that active in signaling indeed instruct size-dependent expression um, of many of the size-dependent genes. I have to stress that it's not all size-dependent genes, so there must be other mechanisms besides active in. Most important question, does this matter? Um, and in order to, to test this, we um, first looked at, again, um, in analogy to the size dependence of proliferation in the system, um, we basically examined now the effect of proliferation levels, which themselves are size dependent, on activin. And without going into any details, we can basically show that um, activin inhibits um, proliferation. And at the same time, when we remove activin signaling, we can change, or when we change activin signaling levels, we can change the growth rates of the entire animals and basically abolish the size dependence of the growth rate. Second, 
We also looked at the size-dependent formation of the reproductive system, which again you can see here um, coming up at this size of about six millimeter. And when we now change activine signaling levels, um, we can um, basically we can change the rate um, at which the reproductive system develops. So most clearly here with egg laying, meaning that when there's more activine signaling in the system, the animals start to lay eggs sooner. Um, and they lay more eggs than other animals of the same size, whereas um, if no activine is in the system, no eggs are being produced. So clearly, therefore, activine does indeed not only influence the growth rate of the animal, but also the size dependence of sexual reproduction in the system. Um, now, finally, where is it expressed? And um, well, where are the components expressed? And then interestingly, again, the activine ligands, they are expressed on the surface of the gut, of the intestine, once again, whereas the receptors are expressed throughout the animal. So basically, um, we think that this essentially means that activin uh, is um, very likely acting as a systemic hormone that has multiple different target tissues. And putting all of this together, so what we can say now is that planarians indeed are um, sensing or have a system in place that senses um, system size via uh, and converts this into size-dependent um, activine signaling, which via dose-dependent uh, dose gene expression changes then ultimately tunes aspects of planarian physiology to the size of the animals. Now, we conceptualize this by borrowing a concept from developmental biology, namely the morphogen concept, um, by um, thinking, or, or thinking of activine as a magnogen, essentially that um, encodes system size on basis of its activity levels, and just like a morphogen encodes space, um, then encodes size information via dose-dependent target gene expression in diverse tissues. Um, interesting questions up next, of course, are on the one hand side, what are the sensors? So what are the mechanisms ultimately that make activine signaling themselves or activine signaling itself size dependent? Here again, we are very excited about the fact that again, activine is expressed from the gut. And so again, you could imagine um, that maybe size allometries in the surface of the gut could actually um, uh, then also be read out via changes in activine secretion um, as size information for the entire system. Second, um, another re really interesting area that we are starting to explore now is the impact of activin on other scaling phenomena in the system. So for example, the scaling of the organism-wide wind signaling gradient from tail to head of the animal, and of course also on metabolic scaling and lipid storage and all these associated things. Um, in addition, there is of course the question of whether magnogens or other size or, or size sensing systems exist in other systems. And I would simply say, given that um, so much biology is actually dependent on size or needs to be tuned to size across multiple different systems, I would be um, amazed if um, size sensing or organismal size sensing at the organismal level is actually not a general feature of biology. And with this, I do thank the people that did the work, so mainly Han, and who is a group leader at Embel now, and Stefan, who is a group leader in Groningen, um, the rest of the crew, our funding, and especially also our long-term theory collaborators in Dresden, so Frank and also Effe. Thank you very much, and I do apologize for running over time.